think I'm on. There we go. Well, it's good to see you. I am Mac. Uh, James McLeod's my name. Everybody calls me Mac. It is Scottish. I do not wear the dress. You know, a lot of people talk about paint horses. The joke is that, you know, the reason the, Indi- the reason the Indians fought so well is because they rode paint horses. By the time they got to the fight, they were ready for it. But they say the same thing about Scottish people. The reason the Scots fought so much is because they made the men wear dresses. <laughs> Cindy and I uh, happened to be in Scotland, actually on a church planting trip. And then uh, I was meeting with uh, uh, people at the University of Edinburgh and uh, basically getting opportunities to talk to agnostic and atheist professors. And while we were there is when COVID broke out and uh, we weren't sure if we was going to get back to the United States of Texas, but we were able to and we're glad we got there. I uh, uh, will talk a little bit about what I do in my work in a little bit. I will tell you this in case I forget. A lot of you know who Jason Bryant is. And uh, uh, I talk about Jason and I have been longtime friends. And I met your pastor through Jason years ago. And I tell people that I did take Jason's place, but I cannot take up his space. So if you know him, you know how big he is. Um, He's, I don't know what is it, but I don't know what he stands like. Got to be six five or something, anyway. And uh, so I can't fill up that much space. How many of you have ever been in a situation that uh, you wish you weren't in? You would rather be anywhere but there. You would rather be anywhere or or with other people than those people at the at the time of that that particular situation. Sometimes things are just simply embarrassing. They're not really, really that bad. They're just a little bit embarrassing, but mostly benign for all purposes. And I, when I first pastored in West Texas, I'm from West Texas, and um, um, I first pastored in West Texas, and I went to see Ruby Nafa. Ruby was about to have surgery this on this particular day in Sweetwater, Texas, and the hospital there and so I went to see her she did not go to our church but her daughter and son-in-law and their kids they went to our church in uh, Lorraine Texas so I went to see her in Sweetwater to, like I did with other people have visit with them a little bit pray with them before they take them off for the surgery and all that and so I take off my hat and I'm I, and I've got it here and and I'm holding Ruby Ruby's hand and I pray with her and, and at the end of my prayer like I generally would do I would say and Lord Uh, You know, let's let her heal as well as she needs to and all this, whatever, and let her get back on her feet doing the things she loves to do. As soon as I said that, it dawned on me, I recalled why she was there. She was about to have a leg amputated that day. (laughs) So, in my manly pastoral role, I immediately put my hat on. I said, we'll see y'all later, and I walked out. (laughs) When I came back to see her, next day the surgery went as needed. Everything was well, and her sisters, or her daughter's, we're not there when I came back in. As soon as I walked in the door, I tapped on the door and opened it, and Ruby lifted that nub of a leg that she now had, and she said, you going to pray for me to get back on my feet again? <laughs> <laughs> she was great. We had a great relationship and all that. You know, but I wish, at that moment, I wish I was anywhere but there after I said that. Well, but harmless. But then there are other situations that are much more serious, like you have been in. When you get the call that four teenagers was just on a wreck out on the highway, two of them did not make it. They're still out there. You get out there, two of them had died. One of them is crippled for life. The other one actually ended up going to prison. Those are times that I wish I was anywhere but there. Or when I was... When we had our oldest daughter in the hospital and the doctors come to us and they say there's nothing more we can do unless God intervenes, there's not much hope here. I wish I was anywhere but there. You see, we had tried for almost 10 years to have children and, and, and it just wasn't working out. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, when we started looking at adoption and really got serious about that, well then... Cindy was able to, to have a child, and then we had another daughter later. And 
But when they told us that, I wish I was anywhere but there. God, where are you? I struggled with, in times before Cindy got pregnant, got all, got all kinds of people having cats like, uh, having kids like cats have kittens. I kind of got that backwards, didn't I? <laughs> Let's hope none of you are having cats. <laughs> Although if you are, talk to me. We can make some money. Why is it that all these people are going to have kids like crazy and we want them, we, we, want, we want to love children, we want to raise children? God, where are you? You know, God brought us through some, through some difficult times and prepared us for things that would come later on in our lives where we trusted God. But sometimes we go through life and we wish we could be anywhere but there. So here's... A question I have for you right now. You're sitting in here in Cowboy Fellowship of Atascosa County. If you could be anywhere right now, if you weren't here, if you could have your choice, you could be anywhere in the world. Where is it that you would want to go? What would you want to be doing? You don't, don't say anything out loud. Just I want you to think about that. Where would you go? What would you be doing? If you could do anything. Where would that be? And then I wonder, I know for me, I love the mountains. I love going to the mountains. Mountains are just, just amazing to me. I used to be a rock climber, freestyle rock climber. And, and I love mountains. I like getting, getting up on top of things. And, and just, it's a great time. Our youngest daughter's the same way. Uh, still is, and, and just we, those are the kinds of things that we love to do. She's my roller coaster buddy, and and we you know the biggest, fastest, baddest, roughest roller coasters. You know that's, that's what we love to do, and you know we we love those things. But what are some things? You think about the trip. Think about where you would like to be. What are some things that might keep you from going there? What are some things that might keep you from taking that trip? So now I want you to. To respond, what are some things that might keep you from doing what you would like to do? Finances. Say that. Finances. Finances. Time. Time. Career. 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 Critters. Okay, I'll go with that. I was a bullfighter for a number of years. A friend of mine I was a bullfighter with, he, used to, he would go to West Texas to go hunting. And I asked him one time, I said, well, why, don't you, why don't you just go move to West Texas? He said, because in West Texas, everything either burns, bites, or stings. <laughs> you don't want to move there. Yeah. Somebody else said something over here. Help. Okay. What if you're on a trip, you're taking a trip, and you're driving, you know, everything's going fine and dandy, and all of a sudden your gas light comes on. And you're out in the middle of nowhere. And, the, and you remember seeing the sign back there that said, next gas station, 50 miles. And you're on empty. I've done that. I've, I, well, I've never done that, never been that bad, but I've been on empty with the car still running and hoping I'm going to make it, and it says zero miles left to go, and I'm still running, still going. When it comes to where we want to go, what we want to do, what, what, it, what it is that, that we want to accomplish in our lives, we've got to make a determination of what the most important things in our lives are. But in that time, we always have, I will say, opportunities to grow in the Lord through tragedy. When you think of tragedy, tragedy could be a calamity, it could be misfortune. It's, it's, it's something that's where you have, in, in our case, in Psalm 40, we're going to read Psalm 40 here in a minute. And so in, in Psalm 40, you've got the, the Psalter, who is the protagonist, where things Things are not going so well, and you've got the, this other thing, the situation out of control. 
A lot of times in our lives we are involved, we're, we're experiencing a situation that is completely out of our control, and we're wondering how we are going to fix it, or God, where in the world are you? And so we have to deal with these, these issues. In Psalm 40, we have a beautiful chapter in Scripture of going from tragedy to triumph. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. And in verse 1, he immediately, verses 1 through 3, he kind of tells the story or gives us the window of what the rest of the, the verses are from verses 4 through 17. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. Now, just so you are aware, in the Hebrew text, he is not waiting patiently like we think of being patient. How many of you, okay, so let me, let, me ask, let me ask the wives. How many of you wives are going to go somewhere with your husband, your husband is ready to go, and you feel like that he's out there at the car, he's at the door, everything's loaded, ready to go, and he's just... Any of you wives have anybody like that? Man, you got some perfect men in here. <laughs> How many of you husbands have a wife who is ready to go, and she's like this? Okay, we need to have a confession booth after church. <laughs> I can tell. I think I'm losing my earpiece here. The word for patient here is not the word, it's not like we would use it in English. It's really a word of consternation, of frustration. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. God, where are you? I'm still waiting. That's the imagery in the Hebrew text. It's not the, the calm, I'm sorry, this thing keeps moving around on me, guys. It's not, the, it's not just that calm, yes, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm, I'm fine, I'm not doing this. So here's a person that's waiting, but frustrated. But they are waiting. This is a beautiful part. And God, God inclined to me. He hears me. Isn't that beautiful? That God himself, the creator, the redeemer, would hear us, would lean into us, there's a song called You Set Me Free. I actually titled this sermon uh, using that song, the title of that song. And You Set Me Free is actually written from this perspective of the first three verses. But the fact that God listens to us, that God hears, and then He reaches down, says He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, that wet clay, that mucky, sticky stuff. I used to think I knew what black dirt was until I moved to northeast Texas. Now I know what black dirt is. I don't want nothing to do with it when it's wet. And think about how sticky and slick and wet this is, this miry clay where you can't get footing. But then it says, but God, he set, his, he set my feet upon the rock, making my footsteps firm. He changed the situation, and he put a new song in my mouth, a, praise, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Here we're looking through the window from tragedy to triumph. In these three short verses, we've gone from this quick snapshot, this little cameo of tragedy to triumph, where God took the Psalter, and, and as he is pouring his heart out, as he's sharing his story, as he is giving his testimony of how God worked in his life, he said, God brought me from this terrible, terrible, deep darkness. And he brings me out of that and sets my feet on the rock, sets my footsteps where they need to go. I am firm. I'm on solid ground because it is God doing this, not me fixing it. Sometimes we try to fix things too quickly. This individual at least was willing to wait on the Lord, even though he wasn't all that patient. And he gets God involved. He cries out to God. 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 
I can see the imagery of Job here. One of the most, most difficult times in my life personally was when it looked like we may very well lose our oldest daughter. She was 14 months old. It was the only child we had at the time. When it looked like we very well may lose her, and I'm wondering, God, where are you? During that time, one of my professors had asked me to do a study and help, help him, assist him. Not that he needed help. He was helping me really learn. He was mentoring me. But to assist him in research on suffering and specifically looking through the book of Job. And that became one of the most important studies for me because I, I saw where if you read through the book of Job, I'd encourage you to read through it as one sitting, just one story. Don't try to read a chapter a day or something. Just sit down and read it as one story. And you can get, you get this imagery because Job is speaking very clearly. He said, I want to see God now face to face. And it's almost like this, this, this reaching out, like I want to reach a hold, get a hold of God by the collar and bring him down, and I want to argue my case face to face. That's the imagery we get in Job. And isn't it interesting that God didn't strike him down? God didn't send a lightning bolt? God's big enough to take our anger, our hurt, our pain. So we see this window. But then we move into the next thing. There's a change of life in verses 4 through 8. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust. Now, to be blessed by God can put simp be, be explained simply to be blessed by him is to be acknowledged by God. We've already seen where God inclined to the Psalter. So be acknowledged by God. To be approved by God, not by something we've done or through anything we've done. You know, we can't buy God off. We can't work God off. We can't do good enough to get in God's graces but because of what his son has done. Being approved by God. So being acknowledged by God, approved by God, and then affirmed by God. And what God wants to use us in. How, how he wants to, to use our lives, our story, our witness, our testimony, our very gifts that he has given us. And so how blessed is man, it says in verse 4, who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Those who, who reach out for fraudulent things to fulfill their lives. Warren Samuels preached a sermon a long time ago that I happened to be at. And I remember him having a pitcher of water and then he had a cup. And, and the, water was, the, the pitcher of water was full, the cup was empty. And he said every morning... So we get up and we have, it's like we have this empty cup and we feel like I've got to fill it with this and this and this. We go running around here and there trying to find all kinds of things to fill our cup with. When God is right there and, he, and, and the, the, the pitcher of water was that representation of God, just want to pour himself into us. It's right there. So the person has made the Lord his trust, not of the things. Verse 5, many, O Lord, are the wonders which you have done. And your thoughts toward us, there is none that can compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. You just can't count it. There's an old song. Count your blessings. How's it go? Count your blessings, name them one. Count your blessings. Awesome. See what God has done to, to, to recognize that God is there. Okay. He said, I can't count all those things. Too numerous. Sacrifice, a meal offering you have not desired. My ears, you, God, have opened. You have dug out. You have pierced, whatever your translation will say. Giving the, the, the message to us that God helps us to really hear the reality of things rather than to be stuck on only looking at the circumstances. Sometimes we look at the circumstances and, and, and we get lost in those things rather than what God is trying to do in the midst of those things. Then I said in verse 7, Behold, I come, I come, 
In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, oh my God. He says, I come, here I am. There's a song that was, ran, that was popular a long time ago. It said, I'm yours, Lord, everything I've got, everything I am, everything I'm not, I'm yours, Lord. Sure, it goes on. How many of you remember that song? It's okay to admit that we're old. <laughs> but that's what this guy's saying, the psalter's saying, here I am, I, I'm coming to you, Father, to you. So see, he has this change of life. And then in verses 9 and 10, we see a change of message. He says, I've proclaimed, and, and you, you see the, the perpetual proclamation here. The unstoppable pro proclaiming of the gospel, of sharing what, what God has done. And the Psalter here is sharing this. He says, I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I'm not keeping it to myself. Okay. It's interesting, just prior to this in verse 8, we don't see it in the English, but in verse 8, where it says, I delight to do your will, oh my God, your law is written in my heart, plural. It's a word that's used, the, the plural is used here for some reason. It's not in the other two instances where the heart is referred to, but it is here. It seems like the Psalter is saying, everything about me is all sold out to you, all for you. So he says, I proclaim the glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. I will not restrain my lips, O Lord. You know I am not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I'm not keeping it to myself but I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed any of this, your loving kindness, your truth from the great congregation. See, he has a different message. That message was referred to in verse 3, where it says that God has put a new song in my mouth. I'm no longer waiting, unpatiently, impatiently. What's the right word, Doc? He ain't patient. No, God has put a new song in his mouth, okay? And other people are hearing this, and so when he's sharing this, he says, you have put this in me, I will not conceal it, your loving kindness, your truth from the great congregation, I want to share this with everyone, so there's a new message. Here's a person that went from being in dire straits and almost to the point of despair to now he is just shouting from the rooftops, what God has done. Has God done anything like that in your life? The question I would ask, I have to ask myself sometimes is, why are you so silent, Mac? Sometimes we can get so consumed by life, we're very silent. This description is, this message, this is ongoing. Man, it's just going. So then, because of what God has done in his life and changed that, he now has this life change, he has this message change. There's a change of focus for him. In verse 11 and 12, Lord, You, Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. Your work, God, will preserve me. Your work is full in me. That's what, so that's what's going to be coming out. Read an interesting little snippet of a story not long ago about an elderly woman that, that was approached or she was going by a table that a funeral home had set up at some, I don't know, Walmart parking lot or whatever. Some, some you know, getting ready for your funeral. You know, be prepared ahead of time and all this. And the guy from the funeral home said something about, you know, we, we deal with all kinds of things, you know. And, and she asked the question, she says, does that include embalming? And he said, oh, why, yes, it does. And he was all hopeful. And she said, Sonny, at my age, I've eaten so many preservatives, I don't need you. 
What is it that we're so full of? And here's a person that's full of what God has done. And so it's coming out, it's flowing out, it's shouting out. And so he, as he says, for verse 12, evil is beyond number. They've surrounded me. My sins have overtaken me so that I'm not able to see. That's all I see. I'm looking at the circumstances often. They're more numerous than the hairs of my head and my heart has failed me. In other words, my life was so bad. My life was so sorry. My life was such a loser's life. But God's now changed that. He had lost hope. My heart has failed me. Literally, the text says it has turned its back on me. It has forsaken me. Verse 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, and help me. His focus is on something different. He knows what it has been. He knows what it needs to be. He knows what God has done. And so now we move to a, a change of perspective. In verses 14 through 17, we see that change of perspective. Let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame and who say to me, Aha, aha, basically, where's your God? He says, Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad, and he's one of those. Let those who love your salvation say continually. See, he's not stopping. The praise continues. The recognition of God's work continues. Say continually, The Lord be magnified. The Lord be magnified. Have you ever been in a situation where you're crying out to God in desperation or anger or frustration and you're just screaming at the top of your lungs? And have you ever been in, in a situation where God has done such a mighty work, you're screaming at the top of your lungs, but it's with joy? We experience both those kinds of things. He says, verse 17, Since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, God. So he's going back to the description of what is now had already taken place. This is what had been going on, but verses 1 through 3 shares what he has experienced in the past and expects again. That God is going to do something mighty. God is going to do something great. I'm a, I, I have a practice that a lot of people have, not just preachers have. But I read a proverb a day. And so today being the 10th, this morning early I read Proverbs 10. And I just kind of take my time. I usually read it out loud. And when I got down to verse 25, When the whirlwind passes, the wicked is no more. But the righteous has an everlasting foundation. There are a lot of times that we are going through difficult situations and we are struggling in a major way, really uncertain as to how we should respond. The best response is turn to the Lord, cry out to, the God, cry out to God, let God deliver you from that. I love Psalm 27. The first verse says in, in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is, a, this, is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? We go through times of great frustration, of great pain, uncertainty. And we tend to focus on only the thing that we see or that we can understand. Or if we focus on what we can understand, we become so overwhelmed with that that we cannot understand that we are deaf to God. We forget that when we cannot see the hand of God, we must trust the heart of God. Because God has His best for us. What's the song we sang, you know, Jordan and the worship team let us in, Chain Breaker? That's a powerful song. It's not just a pretty song with a neat beat, a cool tune, and words that make us feel good. It ought to be something that makes us more than feel good. It ought to reassure our assurance that we know that God has His best for us. 
And so when we cry out to God and knowing that He is going to hear us, regardless of the situation, He may not answer when we want or how we want. But when we put our trust completely in God, just like the Psalter did here in verse 7, says, here I am, I come, all of me, you got it, God. When the Lord blessed us with our second daughter, we nearly lost her when she was almost two. And then later we lost a son. But I can tell you this. that I learned through mentors, through godly people, as I watched them trust the Lord regardless. And that was what made the difference when the time came that we lost our son. That I was able to not fall to pieces and just simply trust God. God, I don't know what you're doing. I, I don't know. But that son was yours all along. So we never got to sing to him. Well, we did. He never took a breath. We sang. We had a time of worship. When that doctor in Amarillo came in and he just kind of nonchalantly said, where's the fetus? I turned, I was holding Cindy's hand and I turned to the doctor she lost him at the house. We were hundred where we lived is a hundred miles away. Hundred and one miles. And I said, Our baby is right over there. And he unwraps the little cloth. He is facing away from me. I am over here with Cindy. He is facing away from me, and he's just kind of doing the doctor thing. And then he puts his hands out on the counter, and he looks up, and he says, Oh, my God. I am so sorry. Before we left that hospital, people there told us at Baptist St. Anthony's, that they cannot recall how many nurses and medical people were talking about that and how that was changing lives and changing minds. You see, we never got to play with young Coulter. But man, I can't imagine what his place like is like in heaven. We just fully trust God. I don't know where you are at, but God is a chain breaker. He is a way maker. He is a pain taker. And this morning you may just need to give it all to the Lord. You've just tried to do it all on your own. You just, you just, you've got this. You know, in cowboy culture, we've got it. I don't need any help. We can be that way. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to give you a chance to do that right now. I'm going to say a prayer. I invite you to, to say this prayer just silently to yourself. Take, take Jesus as your Lord, as your, as your Lord this day so that God can do the work in you, to you, 
for you and through you that he wants to do. Dear God, I know that I need Jesus Christ. Come into my heart, Lord. Take me in everything that I am and everything I'm not, Lord. I just, I just give myself to you. God, I just ask that you would work in me in whatever ways you want. And I thank you for being my Savior. That you come into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we just ask for folks in this room that are struggling. Lord, I know that uh, we're just a few days away from celebrating our, our son's birthday and his home going. Lord, I, that has been such a powerful testimony to your grace in the midst of the, the tremendous loss. But, oh, Lord, we trust you. And we're so thankful that so many lives have been changed and minds have been changed because of what took place with little Coulter. Lord, what a privilege it is to be mom and dad. God, whatever is going on in the hearts of people in this room and people that are watching live streaming, or the struggles they have, the heartbreak, the despair. Lord, just pray you to help them. Let them know you're, you're waiting for them to call out to you and that you will incline yourself to them. You will hear them, hear their heart. God, that you want to heal broken hearts, broken homes whatever it might be. And God, we praise you for victory in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.